Mama Palooza. In 2010, we utilized 30 megabits of bandwidth, deployed fewer than 50 network devices to about 32 locations, and we served a few hundred users. By 2017, our eighth Lollapalooza, we utilized over a gigabit of bandwidth, deployed 461 network devices across 235 locations, and served over 4,000 users. It's quite a jump. Welcome to large-scale outdoor Wi-Fi lessons from Lollapalooza. I'm Alan Cook, the founder and CEO of TourTech. I'm going to share with you a few of the things that we've learned about deploying Wi-Fi at one of the nation's largest outdoor music festivals. I'd like to start off with a favorite quote of mine from John F. Kennedy back in 1962, the start of the space race. He said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Now, I've always been a big fan of the space race, but also uh, the idea that people would decide to do something even though they knew that it was going to be difficult to do. Now, certainly what we're doing here isn't rocket science, but the number one lesson that we've learned is that Wi-Fi is hard. And you see, Grant Park is over 300 acres, and there's not an inch of infrastructure that exists for us to connect into. So everything that's required by the festival has to be installed by our team of about five techs in roughly 10 days. Unfortunately, we're not alone. We've got networks from AT&T, the park district, the guy that runs the snack shack, apartments and condominiums that ring the park, and wireless ISPs beaming signals back and forth between the rooftops of downtown buildings. Add to that all of the networks that we build to do the festival, and you've got the real potential for disaster. When you operate wireless networks in close proximity to each other, you increase the likelihood of performance crippling interference. And this is where, in an average Wi-Fi presentation, um, they did sort of slide a, a lightning Wi-Fi to a garden hose and a fire hose or a three-lane highway and a 12-lane highway, and all of these examples to illustrate the problems that we face dealing with interference, these invisible waves intersecting with other invisible waves and causing problems, never really resonated with me. Um, trying to talk about in air and invisible just didn't work, and I realized that that was, in fact, exactly what we were trying to describe. Um, Wi-Fi is air, and our devices are like our lungs. Um, interference is pollution, it's small, right? So, so our device lungs want to breathe in fresh, clean air and run very, very fast, cruise the internet at lightning fast speeds. But this pollution starts to kick up, this interference from Wi-Fi and other sources, and we can't, we can't go as fast. We, we, start to, we start to feel bad, we struggle with it. And then one day they say, hey, don't go outside. You can't go outside. The pollution is so bad, you can't even connect. Like timeouts, no connection. Now you've got a real problem. Now, we've certainly had our share of challenges at Lollapalooza over the years. But the, one of the hallmarks of our relationship with C3 Presents has been an acceptance of those challenges and the understanding of the inherent benefits that come with their resolution. Uh, they know that we're going to come back the next year with a better, more resilient network not repeating the mistakes that we've made before. So we don't consider these to be failures, we simply add them to the list of things not to do next year. And that leads us to lesson number two, continuous improvement. We are always working on uh, advancing the state of the art, uh, evaluating our network te technology as well as our network topology, and that is to say what we use and where we use it on site to deliver the best possible user experience as close to the user as we can. You'd be amazed by how much wire is involved in wireless networking. That's a quote by me. It's not famous yet, but I'm, I'm working on that. Um, but you would be amazed. The number this year was 50,000 feet. Uh, that's about 10 times more than we ran in 2010. Uh, and for the math leagues in the room, that's nine and a half miles of copper wire. Now, when we started this back in 2010, we built a large point to multi point 5 gigahertz wireless network uh, to distribute the signal across the park uh, as efficiently as possible. But as more and more devices moved from 2.4 into 5 gig, we had to find new ways to do that. So we added 3.65, 24, 39, and 60 gigahertz radios to our inventory. 
And this year we ran about 4,000 feet of fiber optic cable. Now last year at uh, Fest Forms, I gave a talk about uh, the same as last year, why event technology is never the same. And in that, we explored the idea that a festival can take place in the exact same location, uh, with the exact same footprint, the exact same number of fans, and the exact same size staff, but still year after year require more and more connectivity. The devices that we use and the services that they connect to increase exponentially year after year. When we started Lollapalooza, SD streaming was barely a thing. This year, they're streaming in 4K. And that's what accounts for that jump from 30 megabits in 2010 to the over a gigabit uh, in, in 2017. And that's a 3,000% increase uh, in bandwidth in, in less than 10 years. So all of this is made possible by lesson number three, which is planning. Plain and simple. No magic. BusinessDictionary.com defines planning as a basic management function informing, involving the formulation of one or more detailed plans to achieve an optimum balance of needs and demands of the available risk. God, that's a lot of words. <laughs> but really all that matters there are the last ones, the available resources. You see, if we don't plan and we don't bring all the things we need, because remember, there is no infrastructure in the park. If we need it, we have to bring it. And if we don't bring it, the resources aren't available. So TourTech has developed a proven process that we call Big Circles, Little Circles. And in Big Circles, it's pretty easy. Uh, we go in and we look simply at, you have a social media office, you have an access location, you have a sponsor activation. And then we bring our tech team in and we go through Little Circles, where we look at, do you have five or 50 people? Do you need hard lines or Wi-Fi? Is that sponsor trying to do public Wi-Fi? All of these questions help determine not just how much bandwidth the event needs overall, but also the type of network you're required to deliver the required speeds to those locations. And all of that comes through lesson number four, which is communication. Now, and this one is easier, businessdictionary.com defines communication as a two-way process of reaching mutual understanding in which participants not only exchange information, but also create and share meaning. And that's all pretty important there because when we say, I have a social media office, we've exchanged information. But we haven't really created or shared any meaning there until we talk about how many people are in that office. So during the pre-production communication phase, we talk about scope creation and setting a schedule and expectations. We share, we exchange the information but we also create and share some meaning around what those locations are going to do. And then when we get on site, we move into the next phase of communication, and during load-in, we're looking at prioritization, right? Based on the schedule that we have and the things that are already done or being done on site, what can we get done to stick to the schedule? And then as we move into show days, we move into crisis communication. What do we do when the networking is not working? Right? It doesn't do anyone any good if you just grab a radio and shut the Wi-Fi's down. I don't know where you are, I don't know how to help you, I'm not going to be able to get the Wi-Fi back up. We try to treat that a little more like an emergency situation. Where are you? What is the exact nature? If you don't see the Wi-Fi network anymore, it could be as simple as someone has unplugged the, the access point or turned off a power strip. If you see the network, you simply can't connect it. It could be interference, it could be a more serious upstream network issue, we have to dispatch a technician to resolve that. We, we need to keep that communication open and we work with our partners on site so that we know prior to gates opening, we all have an understanding of how we're going to communicate those emergencies. And we follow it all up at the end with an after action review. Nothing new there, not revolutionary. Talk about the good things, talk about the bad things, write them all down, and then save it in a place where you can find it when you start your planning for the next event of the next year. And that leads us to lesson number five, MIMO. Now in, in Wi-Fi, MIMO means multiple in, multiple out. And it's a means of radios and uh, devices uh, using antennas and communicating in multiple streams and doing all kinds of technical things. But, but here, what we're talking about is money in, money out. There's a number of myths 
that has sprung up uh, about Wi-Fi and event Wi-Fi in particular over the years. Um, and one of those in particular is that ad supported public Wi-Fi will generate significant revenue for your event and offset some of the costs of your production IT needs. The truth is, you're not there long enough. The businesses that do generate significant revenue from ad supported Wi-Fi networks are airports, hotels, coffee chains. They have a steady stream of customers and they measure their revenue in months, not days or weekends. The other myth that's very popular is that a public Wi-Fi sponsor is going to come along and cover all of your IT costs. I've heard it shared a lot. I've never seen it happen. The truth is that you're going to have to pay for it. But a quality <coughs> Wi-Fi network can help you generate additional revenue. To do that, we have to reimagine the ROI model just a little bit. A lot of event producers look at IT infrastructure as a sunk cost. There's no way they're going to get their money back. It's just something that they have to do. There's no inherent benefit to doing it other than people don't complain as much. But if you shift that from the sunk cost column over to the investment column and you start to think instead about all the things that can't or won't happen, if you don't make the investment in that network, it starts to get a little easier to justify. For example, when we switched Lollapalooza's merchandise credit card terminals from standard dial-up over to an IP network, they saw a 75% increase in revenue, all because they made the investment in the IT infrastructure to get better service there. Similarly, when Best Ring added cashless payment and credit cards to their bars, transactions were 84% faster than traditional cash-based POS. All of that results in shorter lines and more people moving through those lines, which equals higher revenue. Now, the, the final myth that we're going to look at is that uh, brands will pay huge sums of money for network user data. Um, the truth is that they get all the information that they need from market studies and ticket sales. They've already made the decision to be at that event, uh, so they're not looking for data from that event to get them to come back to that event. What they're looking for are ways to justify that investment, to demonstrate a return on the investment they've already made. And it's not as complicated as uh, it's been made to seem uh, over the last few years as the big data movement has taken off. Uh, it's as simple as how many people are using the amenity? Was it worth spending on? Uh, then you can do some very interesting things, not just using uh, social authentication to figure out what platforms do people like to log in with, um, but we can look at and see what platforms are they posting to. Now, just because someone signs in with Facebook doesn't necessarily mean that they're a huge Facebook fan, right? They may have a Facebook account because they know that they needed to sign into things. And they post all of their content to Instagram or to Snapchat. If you're a marketer, or you're a brand or a sponsor, you want to know where that content is going because if you're spending on Facebook marketing and all of your fans are posting somewhere else, you've missed the mark. So we know that good Wi-Fi equals more POS terminals. And more POS terminals equals shorter lines. Shorter lines equals more money. We also know that data that helps demonstrate a return on the investment equals happy clients. And happy clients equals more money. And that's okay, because you gotta remember, show business is a business, and at the end of the day, we're all here to make money for ourselves and for our clients. So today we've learned that Wi-Fi is hard, but if you are always working on improving the product, you plan and communicate effectively, Wi-Fi will help you make more money. I'm Alan Cook, I thank you for your time and invite you to ask any questions if anybody's got one. Or get lunch if you're hungry. <laughs> Thank you all very much.